So what I will try to do today is share with you some of the advances that we have made in understanding how the brain functions. And I'll do this by focusing on the approaches that we use and also tell you examples from the work done by faculty in our institute, the National Brain Research Center, as also some of the exciting reports that have come recently. So I always like to start where it all began. About 2,000 years ago, uh, Hippocrates was the first person to elucidate that from the brain and the brain only arise our pleasure, joys, laughter, pain, grief, and tears. But having said that, we all very clearly understand that the brain does not replicate the external world. It's not a mirror that we see, but in fact, it recreates and restructures reality. And I think the challenge as neuroscientists that we face is how does such, how do the processing, the mental processes that occur, which convert the sensory inputs into the response that we see. And traditionally, two approaches have been used to study the brain. One is the reductionist approach, such as those as scientists such as me uh, do, where we look at molecular processes and try to build up from the bottom-up approach. The other approach has been the top-down approach, where you study behavior and try to get down to how the processes underlie behavior. Neuroscience has emerged as an independent discipline just about 40 years ago. I think Dr. Marder should correct me if I'm wrong. From the fringes of psychology at one end of the spectrum and biology at the other end of the spectrum, and I would like to add computational science as a very integral part of what we do in neuroscience today. Also um, important is the fact that neuroscience is probably a role model for integrative biology and integrative science. Very often, we see teams of mathematicians, physicists, computational scientists working with geneticists and molecular biologists and now imaging specialists to approach a single problem in terms of brain function. Now, when we look at what we need to do, the task is awesome. So, from birth to death, we what neuroscience endeavors to do is to understand behavior and understand the biological basis of information process that regulates at different levels of this, starting from a single neuron to systems to whole brain, network systems and whole brain, using tools such as genetics, molecular biology, cellular signaling, neurophysiology, and imaging. So typically, and we need to do this because of the hidden burden of brain disorders. And this, is, this graph, actually the pie chart shows the disease burden of brain disorders in developing countries such as India, where one thinks of the basic, the major brain uh, disease burden as coming from infectious diseases. One third of the disease burden is contributed by brain disorders. And the prevalence around the world is 25% um, if we take the total disability caused by brain disorders and 33% if we include alcohol and substance abuse. And because no cures are known, are seen since pathogenic mechanisms are unknown, and better public health and primary health care cannot lower incidence of brain disorders. And as we heard from the previous speaker, post-traumatic stress disorders, psychiatric disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorders or brain injury, we still don't have cures. So this, I think, underlies uh, the importance, understates the importance of studying the brain. Now, typically what we do is to look at understanding the brain across several levels of organization starting from molecules to single cells such as neurons to network systems and behavior. And integrating this is a very important component where neuroscience, informatics science, and computational science come together to form a new science, neuroinformatics, that attempts to <coughs> collate information across these different levels of organization and help us look at new knowledge. So the challenge actually is while research has focused at different levels, how do we integrate this information into a single unifying platform and study the brain across from molecules to behavior? And that, I think, is the great challenge of neuroinformatics. And in order to do this, typically, uh, neuroscience has several subdisciplines ranging from molecular to cellular to behavior systems, and today, um, neurotechnology, neuroinformatics, and 
a student of neuroscience, often, as we do in our own institute, we recruit engineers, mathematicians, physicists, and train them into the biological angles of neuroscience. So it's indeed a challenge to produce human resource that can bridge across disciplines, and it is only through such people that new knowledge probably would emerge in terms of understanding the brain. So while we talk of Hippocrates as the father of um, the first person to propose that brain underlies emotions and functions, um, I think one cannot give a talk on human brain or neuroscience without paying homage to the father of modern neuroscience, Santiago Ramani Cajal, who first showed that the functioning signaling unit in the brain is indeed this beautiful cells, the neuron. And these are actually the cells drawn by Cajal when he first showed the that the brain was indeed made up of these functional units. Cajal also showed that there was a certain, um, the, the brain was an information processor and followed a certain principle wherein information was received through axons, uh, received through dendrites and passed on through axons. The term synapse, which was coined later by Charles Sherrington, it reflects the point where these neurons talk to each other. Now, coming to the 21st century, when the human genome was unraveled, there was a lot of excitement. We thought, as humans, we would have several thousands of genes more than the worm, the C. elegans, which is about a millimeter long. And what you actually find is this one millimeter long worm has about 20,000 genes as against 30,000 that we possess. So what makes this different is actually the million billion synapses that we have as compared to the 5,000 synapses of the world. So as we would say it, it's the networks that make us the people we are. And the level and complexity is determined by the complexity of these networks that we generate. Now, two things made a big difference in the last two decades. Two approaches made big difference, as I've said before, in the last two decades. One was at the molecular end, where we were able to generate animals which had, we, where we could knock out a gene or add genes, and we could study global expression of genes using microarrays. And more recently, we can look at single nucleotide polymorphisms across half a million single nucleotide polymorphisms on a single chip. So we could start identifying genetic diversity with behavior. And at the other end came this wonderful molecular modern imaging techniques such as the functional magnetic resonance imaging, which looks at the blood oxygen level signals, and we are able to actually visualize the brain while we perform a function. So what fMRI does is actually provides us a window into the brain as we perform. While functional MRI does not give us the spatial resolution, we often couple it with electroencephalography to give us more spatial and temporal uh, resolution. I think the combination of these two techniques is what has helped us uh, to make dramatic leaps in our understanding of the brain, although as I go along, we'll realize that there's a lot more that is to be done. So starting from where we all begin, so in utero, at about three weeks of age, uh, the structures in the brain start to emerge, and cells are formed at the rate of about quarter million cells a minute, and we are born with the gamut of 100 billion neurons that we carry, as Dr. Parmentola mentioned. So what is it that makes it different as we move along? What we makes it different during the development is the formation of these networks. So at birth, you see the, the networks are pretty less complicated. But as we move along and as experience guides the generation of networks, so by two years old, you see the complexity. So, and we also realize that the structure of the neurons change during the learning process that to accommodate these networks. Both genes and environment contribute to the generation of networks, so one cannot just put it as the environmental cues alone, but genes also play a role, and I think the work of Anirvan Ghosh showed the presence of a gene called Crest. While it, animals appear normal at birth, they do not generate networks if the gene is knocked down. So as we have often been the uh, dilemma, genes and environment, nature and nurture, both guide the outcome. So at this point, I want to talk to you a little bit about the work done by Dr. Saumya Iyengar, 
uh, with Sarah Bosher um, on our aspect of learning. As we know, learning is one of the most remarkable aspects of behavior, and our ability to modify our behavior through learning is actually what makes us uniquely human. And the question that Soumya asked was, what happens as we learn? And for this, she chose to use a model bird, a songbird, the zebra finch, that learns to sing from its father. So we all have critical periods of learning, and in the zebra finch, this learning period goes from 20 to 60 days of age, which is when the major auditory learning takes place. If the bird fails to learn from its father during this critical period, it never learns to sing all through its lifetime. So if you deprive the bird of auditory stimuli, it never learns to sing all through the lifetime. So what Soumya did was to look at the formation of networks, the dendritic arbors, as the bird learns to sing from its father. And she actually did what is known as axonal tracings and quantitated it. And the results are indeed dramatic that as the bird learns to sing from the father, the pruning occurs, so the networks that are used are strengthened and those that are not used are pruned away. The showing very clearly that, that as learning processes occur, we prune away the unnecessary um, connections and use those that we need. And the brain works on a very single, simple principle of use it or lose it. The more we use, those networks are strengthened, and those that we don't use are pruned away. And she showed this very beautifully in the Songbird system. Now coming back to the situation, this, this actually, here, Soumya's work also showed the plasticity, that is the ability of the brain to form networks, eliminate networks, underlies the phenomenon of plasticity, a plasticity that we carry all through our life. And here I would like to talk to you a little bit about the work of another scientist of, from BIRC, Dr. Neera Jain. So this, this strip of the brain, the purple strip, represents a sensory cortex representing the taste and touch, and he particularly focuses on the somatosensory cortex. This strip of cortex actually has a representation of the human body, and the amount of space that's represented in the body is directly proportional to the touch sensitivity of that part of the body. The hands and the fingers have a large representation, the lip, the face, whereas the legs have a much smaller representation across this what we call as the humunculus. What Neeraj and with John Kaas was able to show is that when you lesion the spinal cord such that the input to the fingers, the hand, is lost, and you allow the monkey to recover, and then you start mapping the somatosensory cortex using very careful electrophysiology, you then see that the hand region the face region has actually moved into the hand, showing very clearly that there is no empty real estate in the brain, and that when there is a vacant real estate and when that part of the brain does not have a function, the adjacent part moves into that part of the brain. This shows the enormous plasticity of the brain and also points to how one could exploit it for treatment of brain disorders or for achieving the human potential. I think there lies the challenge of how one could exploit the functioning, the, the power of the brain to enhance the human potential. And there then goes the next question is, can we make one part of the brain do the function of another part? This was the question that Mrigang Sur asked at MIT. And what they did was to take young ferrets, a type of cat, and rewire the brain just during the critical period, that is soon after birth. And what he did was to connect the eyes. This is a cartoon that represents the connection from the retina to the visual cortex through an area called the lateral geniculate nucleus, LGN. So he actually rewired this lateral geniculate nucleus to the auditory brain. And then as the animals developed, asked a question, does the auditory brain then see? And he was able to show very clearly that the ferrets do respond to visual stimuli and form the, the characteristic pinwheel pattern through optical imaging. So what Mrigang's work showed is that provided we rewire pretty early on, um, 
one part of the brain can actually take over the functions of another part of the brain, and such is the plasticity. Today, through functional imaging, we know very clearly that people who are born congenitally blind actually use the visual cortex right at the back of the brain while reading the brain. So experience, to a large extent, can guide the network formation and can generate plasticity in the brain. One of my favorite, favorite stories is that of the London taxi drivers. And I say it very, I, I quote the story very often in my talks. So this was a group in England who looked at the volumes of different structures in the brain of London taxi drivers. And the reason they chose London taxi drivers was because London taxi drivers go through an extremely uh, stringent exam where they have to have the whole spatial map of the London roads into, in their heads before they can be certified as taxi drivers. So they have extraordinary spatial memory capability. And they looked at volumes, so here. So this is not functional imaging, but structural imaging. So what they showed was, what they saw was, the volume of the posterior hippocampus was actually larger in the London taxi drivers. And there was a compensatory uh, decrease in the volumes of the anterior hippocampus. So they then asked the question, do people with larger posterior hippocampus become taxi drivers? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a very valid question. And what they actually found was that the increase in volume was directly proportional to the years the taxi drivers had driven the taxi. That means experience guides the plasticity and results in increase in volume of those structures that we use maximally with a compensatory decrease in other faculty. And I always tell this when I address school children. So if this were indeed, if you had to stretch this a little more, if we sit in front of the TV with just that auditory and visual stimuli and nothing more, I mean, one can actually imagine what a lifetime of such sitting would do to our brains. So I think one of the major uh, analog that comes out is that if we have to age gracefully and remain alert, you then have no, what you do is to keep your mind alert, keep continuing to work and challenging your brain. And I always think of my dad as a great example who doesn't, uh, who at 80 will do five Sudokus and walk about 10 miles a day to keep himself alert. And he hopes this will prevent him from getting dementia. So now coming from, I've, I've talked about um, nature um, in terms of uh, nurture, in terms of the environment influencing. The question then comes to genes influence behavior. I think this is a very important question and of course ethically a very challenging question too. And I want to share with you a report that came out about two years ago. So this group in um, Switzerland, what they had done was to take about 300 college students, give them a list of 30 nouns, and they were asked to recall those nouns after five minutes and 24 hours. This is typically an episodic memory task. And they then um, divided them into four groups, that is the best and the worst performers and those that fall in between. Took the blood of these volunteers and put them through a half a million chip array which would detect single nucleotide polymorphisms in the DNA. And through careful analysis, they were able to actually separate out the best and the worst performance performers based on an allelic variation in the gene called Kibra, where one nucleotide, C, was replaced by a T. So those who had the T allele showed a better performance as compared to those who, have, who did not have the TLE. This is a remarkable, remarkable finding in just normal volunteers. They then went on to see if those who did not carry the TLE, that is those who were in the group that did not perform well, there were some outliers who did perform well, they did the functional imaging of those people as they performed these tasks. And what they found was these people who carried the C, the C and not the T actually activated their brain longer as compared to those that carried T allele, showing that even those who performed well in the, with the C allele had to work much harder to get the same level of performance at the T allele. And of course, this makes me feel very happy because in Asian population, the T allele is most frequent at about 75% frequency as compared to the Caucasians. 
But I think this, this uh, probably, which is why they do better at college exams. <laughs> But I think what's important here is the fact that a polymorphism in a single gene could have such a profound effect in terms of a pretty complex task, such as an episodic memory task. The other interesting thing that comes about is, so we are now talking of the gene environment interactions where genes on one hand can influence behavior. The other question is, can environment influence gene expression? That's the next question that one asks. I think these are, these are probably one of the most challenging questions in neuroscience. And so this is the work of Sai at uh, Harvard. And what they did was they took animals. I will then tell you how they genetically modified these animals and in, put some in a normal cage and put some in an enriched cage, which had toys, a running wheel, and these toys would be changed every day, and the rats and the mice would have a large space to run and interact. And what they had done was actually to take a transgenic animal in which the gene was induced, a P25 gene, which actually resulted in neurodegeneration. So a, a subset of neurons in these animals was lost. But when these animals were put into this enriched cage, they were able to actually improve the memory as compared to the ones that were in the normal cage. So even when the neurons are lost, putting animals in an enriched environment resulted in increased performance, showing that you could probably upregulate the plasticity of the remaining neurons that did not die. But what was interesting was they also showed that certain proteins involved in synaptic function actually the gene expression was dramatically increased following their being in an enriched environment. So what we are now seeing is enriched environment per se could drive the expression of genes through plasticity effects. Now the molecular determinants of these are not clearly understood, but enough to say that there is a complex um, interaction between gene and uh, environment driving each other and regulating each other. And this, again, represents a method that one could use to exploit human potential or treat brain disorder. The other interesting thing is, as we know the work of Fred Gage, that we continue to generate new cells in the brain, even as adults. And this occurs in a region called the dentate gyrus. But what was interesting was that if you take a set of animals and look at the new cells that are being generated through a process of labeling, uh, we see the red cells represent the new cells, BRDU label. So if you exercise physically the animal, it generates more cells than a control animal. Or further, more importantly, if you put it in an enriched environment, you can have increased neurogenesis. So whether this happens in humans is not yet known. It's difficult to show. But definitely represents a potential area of intervention as also um, an understanding of how environment can regulate new cells being born in the brain throughout our lifetime. So I want to switch gears here and talk to you about the work of Aditya Murthy at NBRC, where he tries to understand the computational algorithms by which we control our actions. Adi is interested in trying to understand how we make errors, how we correct errors. And what he does is to use the saccades, the rapid eye movements, and psychophysical tasks to explore this in human volunteers. And at the same time, he, per he trains non-human primates to perform these tasks while he records from their frontal eye field during their task and in awake behaving animals. A very challenging uh, experiment. So this is the kind of task that Adi puts through in a TV monitor. So you have your focus here, a target appears. And after a certain time, another target appears. And the volunteer is instructed not to go to the first target, but to go to the second. So this would be a correct saccade. So this shows how you stop going to the first target and go to the second target, inhibitory control. And the second is if he makes the error, he then corrects it, which talk, helps him monitor errors. So the question that Adi asks is, when does the corrective preparation start? So the, essentially, the question is, how do we correct our errors, and when do we correct our errors? 
So to answer this, to probe this question, what they, he did was, so this target appears, and as he's making the error, the target shifts. So if indeed he was correcting the error after the error has happened, he would go straight from the correct, from the green to the red here. But if he was correcting the error even before the error happened, he would actually go to the old target and then shift case to the new target. So this is what he sees. So this is actually um, a recording of the saccadic movements as the person makes it. But see, you see here, as the target shifts, he does not go to the, so the, he goes to the old target and not to the new target, showing that corrective preparation begins before the error is made itself. So we are pre-programmed to start correcting errors even before we make the errors. So he then went on to show how, when we do error, when we, how does the network operate when we make errors? Now, when there is a goal and a movement, so how does the brain deal with the problem when the networks are not performing optimally? You have a performance monitoring network that evaluates performance and helps you correct it so what you actually see is when there is a given a stimulus and if you make an error, suppose your reaction time is n plus 1, when you actually correct it, you have a larger reaction time. So you take longer to do a same action that you first made a mistake. That means our performance monitoring network comes into play and we then correct our error and delay performing that action. And what he found was very interesting that in Parkinson's patient, this error correction is impaired. So while we talk of the movement disorders in Parkinson's, an important aspect of Parkinson's is cognitive dysfunction, which is becoming more and more apparent. So in neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's, the performance monitoring networks actually do not function as optimally as we do. I think what I like about Adi's work is by using very non-invasive, simple techniques, he can ask profound questions such as, which are involved in our behavior in terms of error monitoring and error correction. So I think I am, uh, I just wanted to share with you, uh, considering that this is your interest in um, developing uh, automated vehicles and trying to understand brain function about a recent, a very recent um, report that came in uh, Nature. So the idea was, can we decode brain activity using functional magnetic resonance imaging? This was important because magnetic resonance fMRI represents a very non-invasive method of monitoring activity. So what they did here was a bunch of images. They first developed a receptive field model for voxel to voxel for a bunch of images based on the Gaber wavelet pyramid. And then the brain activity was measured as volunteers were looking at a series of about 1,200 images, and the voxel activity pattern was recorded. They then had the volunteers look at 120 images, and they were actually able to predict which image was looked at by their by their analysis. So in effect, you are able to monitor the brain activity and predict the response. So this actually was uh, a, a really innovative manner in which fMRI was used and has a lot of potential in terms of being able to predict the brain actions. So I thought that was a very interesting uh, thing. So, they, so when they were recorded while subject viewed and they could actually predict which of the images they were using in a double-blind manner. So if in conclusion, I would like to say that the last 25 years have seen a convergence or integration of the different branches of science uh, as compared to the last 50 years. And today, one is limited not by one's speciality, but by only by our ability to integrate, say, from mathematics and computation to biology. And such convergence is what's probably needed to address the challenges that lie ahead of us in neuroscience. And 
while we have technology now for understanding behavior and biochemistry, molecular genetic mechanisms serving brain function, identification of complex anatomical circuits, ability to mo monitor neural activity in complex networks, and also visualize human function during activity, one needs to integrate all this to answer these questions that have been put forth as the grand challenges of the 21st century by the Institute of Medicine Forum on Neuroscience and Nervous System Disorders. Uh, these questions, this, these three simple questions probably reflect the whole gamut of neuroscience and the challenges that lie ahead of us. Firstly, how does the brain work and produce mental activity? Does physical activity in the brain lead to thought, emotion, and other behaviors? This has been one of the greatest challenges to understand the mental processes underlying the complex functions of the brain. And I think today, with the technological advances, we are in a position to answer some of these questions. But what is needed, I think, is large-scale efforts where people with diverse backgrounds, and I think it's beyond the scope of a single laboratory or a single individual or even a single laboratory. What is needed in today's neuroscience is a massive collaborative effort to understand such complex functions and setting up of massive infrastructure facilities to undo that. The other major question is nature versus nurture. How does the interplay of biology and experience shape our brain and make us who we are today? This question is of profound importance because we believe that the imprint of diseases that occur in adulthood such as schizophrenia or Alzheimer's uh, and also developmental disorders such as autism, the imprint is laid very early on during development right in utero. So understanding how the brain develops and the interplay of nature versus nurture would be another very important question. And of course, the third question, as all of us age, that would be very important would be, how do we keep our brain healthy? How do we protect, restore, and enhance the functioning of our brain as we age? And I think coming from India, although it's considered as a young country in terms of our demographic of our population, we are going to have 100 million people over the age of 60 by 2010. So with a billion people, the numbers quickly add on. And so actually, uh, although this came out of uh, the Institute of Medicine Forum in USA, the last two questions are of increasing importance to countries like India with a growing population at one end of the spectrum and an aging population at the other end of the spectrum. Thank you very much.